Greetings and salutations, young true believers. So, for today, in her Justice Engendered, Martha Minow is talking about um, legal matters, right? Obviously, what happens uh, when an extremely difficult case is brought before a judiciary. She uses the Supreme Court of the United States as her example, right? And she asks us to consider what happens, what might happen, right, if the case in question involves uh, a court primarily composed of el older white men, right, uh, that has to decide a case um, that bears upon the rights of women, uh, religious minorities, uh, gay persons, right, or transgendered persons, right, or persons of color, right? And obviously this question relates to a larger question, uh, and this is something that I talked about in my doctoral dissertation. What is the scope, what are the limits of human objectivity? Can we be objective, and if we can be objective, to what extent, right? So. There are several obstacles to overcome minnow notes with, with this problem, right? Number one, the first challenge is trying to take seriously the point of view of people labeled different, right? Someone is labeled different, right? And, and not necessarily explicitly labeled different, right? This is one of the rubs as well. Uh, there's an unstated norm, right? The unstated norm in contemporary American society and one that we're struggling to move past, and if you, again, if you wish to understand a lot of the current turmoil, uh, the cultural turmoil, social turmoil in this country right now, it's because there's a default norm. And the default norm is white, straight, Christian male, right? White, straight, Christian male, middle class, right? That's the default norm, right? So. How do we move beyond that assumption, right? That default norm to take seriously the viewpoints of others, right? So on page 244, Minnow writes, if you're a person with power, right? You're in a position to make uh, important decisions, right? You may realize the dilemma of difference. By taking another person's difference into account and awarding goods or distributing burdens, you may or you risk reiterating the significance of that difference and potentially its stigma and stereotyping consequences. But if you do not take another person's difference into account in a world that has made that difference matter, right, you may also recreate and reestablish both, both the difference and its negative implications, right? It's extraordinarily difficult for human beings to do, right? We always talk about putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, but when push comes to shove, that's not easy to do. A responsible member of a judiciary will at least make the attempt to do this, right? We should all make the attempt to do this, but it's extremely incumbent upon those whose decisions are going to impact the lives of, you know, several million anonymous people. They they have an extreme duty, if you if you will, right? An extremely important duty to try to do this, right? So what should we do? Well, again, on 244, mental rights, uh, these dilemmas become less paralyzing if you try to break out of unstated assumptions and take the perspective of the person that you have called different. Once you do that, you make glimpse that your patterns for organizing the world are both arbitrary and foreclose their own reconsideration, right? Now, gang, this points at a general truth about human beings. We cannot begin to understand a world if we engage with every single specific instance, every single specific case, right? Um, if I withhold judgment that all crows are black because I've only seen 15 black crows, right? Again, that, that, let's assume that that encompasses the whole of my experience with crows, right? Then I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself at a disadvantage. We have to generalize to understand the world. I've seen a finite, a finite amount of crows, and I don't know how many. Let's say, let's assume it's 3,000, right? So I have a general assumption about crows. All crows are black. I have a general assumption about male cardinals. They're all red, right? Uh, I have a general assumption about the weather in springtime, early springtime. It's going to be rainy, right? We have to generalize to understand the world. The problem is, right, 
human beings are all individuals. We can make generalizations about human beings. I mean, that's that's what we do when we, for example, study the, the science of psychology. We're making generalizations about human beings. We do that when we study the science of anthropology. We're making generalizations about human beings, but they, those generalizations can be dangerous. They can be dangerous. They can lead to stereotypes, right? And human beings, it's difficult for a lot of human beings to resist what I call the siren call of stereotypes. Stereotypes are dangerous, whether they're positive stereotypes or negative, they're dangerous, right? So Minnow continues, if you try to take the view of the other person, you will find that the difference, right, you notice is part of the relationship or comparison you draw between that person and someone else with reference to a norm. Again, the default norm in the United States, white, male, straight, Christian, middle class, right? And you will then get the chance to examine the reference point you usually take for granted. Maybe you will continue, maybe you will conclude, excuse me, that the reference point itself should change, right? Again, this is a drive toward more objectivity, right? Again, uh, think of it as a quest to try to find what's more basically, much more fundamentally human, right? She goes on to note, I have also argued, this is again page 244, however, that we often forget how to take the perspective of another. We forget even that our point of view is not reality and that our conceptual schemes are simplifications. Again, generalizations. Simplifications is absolutely the right world, word, right? Simplifications that serve some interest and uses rather than others. We forget because our minds, and probably our hearts, by which she means our ethical centers, obviously, cannot contain the whole world, and so we reduce the world to shorthand that we can handle. That's that's the appeal of stereotypes. It's shorthand. It makes things easy, but it makes things highly inaccurate. And again, might sound somewhat innocuous. Oh, you know, comedians use stereotypes all the time. It's funny. It's not funny. It's just dangerous, right? You You run the risk of simplifying the complex to a point where you're actually doing harm, right? She goes on to note, if we want to preserve justice, we need to develop a practice for more knowing judgments about problems of difference. We must stop seeking to get close to the truth and instead to get close to other people's truths, right? What have they experienced? What have they suffered? What have they endured, right? In this section, I argue that we must persuade others as much as they must persuade us about the reality we should construct. Justice can be impartial only if judges acknowledge their own partiality, right? Justice depends on the possibility of conflicts among the values and perspectives that justice pursues, right? Justice is always going to be imperfect. It's always going to be an incomplete project, but we can advance it by degrees to the extent that we recognize and try to bracket off our own partiality, 